Morning, everyone. My name is Kamal. It's my privilege to be bringing us God's word and let us pray and ask God's Holy Spirit to be in us and amongst us so that we may hear God's word, not just the ravings of some Sri Lankan. Thank you, Father God, that we can come to you as your people to hear your word. And we rejoice that you, Holy Spirit, promise to bring the true word of God to us. Be with me, be with us, be with all those online. We praise you for the technology that we may hear from even a remote location. And please change us that we may conform to Jesus Christ, your word incarnate, according to your scriptures, your word written. Amen. A couple of days ago, when I was just uh, wandering around the streets, I happened to cross someone who was wearing a t-shirt that said, Religion is the death of reason. I mean, the guy didn't, wasn't having a go at me or anything. He was just walking down the street as I was. But it really struck me because that's what we're trained to think these days, isn't it? We tend to think that we are scientific now in the 21st century. We're rational people and we don't need all this mythology about religion. In fact, we're so rational, we're so learned these days that we know that we humans are no different from animals. I mean, animals have sex, the, their DNA replicates through other animals, and then they die and return to dust. And we're the same, isn't it? So we're, in principle, no different from monkeys or whales or, for that matter, amoeba or the cockroach you stepped on this morning. And in fact, we're so scientific and rational these days that we don't even know whether we're boys or girls, men or women. Our objective biology doesn't matter anymore. All that matters is our subjective convictions about who we are. Mm, progress. Science. Rational. Today's Bible passage challenges us that true religion is deeply rational. And that actually running away from the one true God, anti-Christianity, is irrational, therefore unhealthy and fragmenting. If we want to, please, I encourage you, have your Bibles open, either a paper Bible or your device. But I also encourage you, please have open the outline for today. You can find it on gracepoint forward slash go forward slash sermon, or it should be in the bulletin as well. And part of the reason I want you to have the outline is that I wound up maxing out one point of the sermon and we're going to go really fast through all the others. So don't panic, okay? <laughs> just, I'll explain how that works as we go. Now, sometimes when we think of religion and rationality, we need to realize that what I mean and what the Bible means by religion, following Jesus, is not mindless rituals, okay? Rituals that have no meaning beyond merely tr replicating tradition. And just because it's what we've always done, that's not real religion. That's not what the Bible means. That's not what I mean. In fact, that's not religion at all. That's accounting. Uh, you know the joke about why did the accountant cross the road? He looked in the file and that's what they did last year. I can say that, okay? I used to be an accountant. Now you know why I became a church minister. I needed some more excitement in my life. Anyway. Anyway, getting back to the Bible, biblical Christianity, true religion, is actually really energizing and innovating because it's rational. It opens our horizons. It actually gives us new options that we wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And because it's not just intellectual, it changes the way that we live. See, that's the other problem with thinking about religion and rationality. It can sound, you know, cold and distant and just intellectual. That's not what I mean. That's not what the Bible means by the rationality of religion. Biblical Christianity, biblical religion, holds our life and our belief together. And in fact, it even changes our feelings so that we want to live for God, God. We want to obey God. We'll see that in today's passage. In fact, it's the opponents of Christianity who are angry, irrational, and antisocial. Christianity, following Jesus, integrates. Okay, It brings everything together. That's biblical rationality. It brings everything together in a good, healthy, wholesome, satisfying and good way of life, intellectually satisfying and emotionally satisfying 
and good for life. It's the opponents of Christianity that disintegrate, break everything apart in a way that is angry and antisocial, all right? Okay, so now we're on my first main point. Gospel rationality disrupts Thessalonian society. First of all, it is a Christian evangelical gospel rationality, okay? The passage focuses on the way that the apostle Paul reasoned out the message about Jesus. Let's read from verse 1. Acts chapter 17, verse 1. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he Bible-bashed people, forcing them to believe him through intimidation and the power of his personality. (laughs) That's not what it says, is it? On three Sabbath day he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Folks, we are quite rightly suspicious of people who try to force us, intimidate us, to believe what they believe just through the power of their personality or just because they're shouting at us. That's not what Paul did. He reasoned and explained things out. And so the challenge for all of us is, Have we taken on board, if we call ourselves Christian, have we taken on board the Christian gospel because we've reasoned it out? Because we think that it's been proven to us from scripture? Or do we call ourselves Christian just because mommy told us? Just because that's what all our friends are doing. Oh, I go to a Christian school, so all my friends are Christian, so I guess Christianity is cool. No, it's not. You can't be a Christian just because mommy tells you, not as an adult anyway. Okay, For those of the young children up in Sunday school that may be adequate, children are still maturing. Anyone who's here, anyone who's listening online, you are mature enough. There you go, little Emmett is allowed to believe just because uh, mommy says so. For those online, Emmett just did a squeal. Um, okay, But n- anyone else? You need to reason it out yourself. But notice what kind of rationality it is. In verse 2, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. The Bible is the historical record of God's words and his works. What God really did and what God really said. And his words explain what he did so that we can understand what God's up to. Now that means... That Christian biblical rationality is not strictly scientific, and that's fair enough, because you can't put history in a test tube. I mean, that's just a fact, isn't it? My personal history is that my parents and I migrated from Sri Lanka in 1989, January. And we came here because of the Sri Lankan civil war, and no one was shooting at us, but it was really unpleasant and unhappy place to live at the time. But we can show you documents, you know, we can bring friends who can testify, yes, we knew them in Sri Lanka. But what if it's all a conspiracy? What if I came here as a secret plan to have the Sri Lankans take over Australian and Sydney evangelicalism, starting with the appointment of a Sri Lankan to Archbishop of Sydney? Hey, see, I mean. If you're a conspiracy theorist, nothing I do to show you the rationality of my personal history can convince you. And you can't put my history in a test tube. It just doesn't work like that. The Bible is the historical record. It's the documentation of what God really did and really said throughout history. His words and his works. God speaks to people and the Bible records what he says. And then he does awesome acts to save and sometimes judge, punish his people. And the Bible records that and his words through his prophets, his spokespeople, they explain what God is up to. And so the challenge for us is are we open-minded enough to consider that the Bible really is a historical record. I mean, you don't need to believe it straight up, that's fair enough, but are you open-minded to even think about it? Because it has unusual things, yeah. Like the Exodus, a whole lot of plagues and miracles. 
but it also has unusual things like God rebuking and judging his own people. See, think about it. If the Bible was a fake religious document that was just meant to advance the power and prestige of God's people, why would it have so much information on what a bunch of sinners and rebels his people were? And how even great leaders like King David were murderers and adulterers. It's so negative, it pays out so much on its own people. That's strange as well. Unusual, like the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Unusual, yes. Unusual doesn't mean impossible, does it? I mean, who would have thought that one tiny strand of RNA would stop the whole world and kill, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people? But we're living through it. Unusual does not mean impossible. Are you willing to consider and be convinced that the Bible really is God's record of how he is saving the world? Because that record centers on Jesus as the Christ. At the end of verse 3, the Apostle Paul says, This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Now, gospel rationality is scriptural, but that scriptural rationality is deeply personal. So it's not just about learning doctrine. I mean, we are a doctrinal, confessional church, and I'm very glad of that. We uh, use a confession and things like that. But all of that is meant to fan our love for God, our love for Jesus. That's what today's confession said, isn't it? It's right for those of us created by God to love God and to live for him and to live for his glory, to worship him. That's what we want. We want, through the Bible, we want you to know Jesus personally and to love him. Sometimes we can oppose, we can put like doctrine and love as opponents. Sometimes we can think that some Christians are doctrine people, especially Presbyterians with our confessional heritage, we, come, we, we are big on doctrine, but other Christians, they're the love, the pastoral Christians. They, they just want to give everyone a warm cuddle. That may be true for personality types. That may even be true for a certain character of denominations. But that is not gospel rationality. If we as a church, if we as a denomination are more intellectual and don't live it, that we, if we don't have love for God and love for our neighbor, we need to repent. That's not biblical rationality. That's not Christian rationality because remember, biblical Christian rationality integrates. It holds together our knowledge and our love and the actions that flow from that love. Love for God and love for neighbor. It's really, really simple, okay? What God has joined together, don't let anyone separate. That's about it. Jesus himself says, that scripture is about him. John 5.39, don't look it up. Uh, John 5.39, it says, search the scriptures, they testify about me. And later in that same gospel, the apostle John himself says, these are written, John 20 verse 31, John 20 verse 31. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So folks, are we willing to change our beliefs about Jesus according to the scriptures, according to the Bible. Because it's easy for us to believe a Jesus of our own imagination, a Jesus that is convenient to us. And that convenient Jesus will look like us and look like our own history and our own preferences. Oh, I believe in the loving and tolerant Jesus, the Jesus who affirms everyone. Or you could believe in the vigorous, strong, active Jesus, you know, Jesus who rolls up his sleeve and stands against all of this cultural Marxism of today. How do you know either side, left or right, if you know what I mean? Okay, politically, how do you know you're not just projecting your own preferences onto Jesus? That's idolatry. We need to change and, our, and be constantly reforming, repenting, changing our minds and our beliefs about the real Jesus according to Scripture. And then we need to love and live for this Jesus, integrating our emotions even, 
and the life that flows from that emotions. Because the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge puffs up and love, but love builds up. And in 1 Corinthians 13, 2, that was 1 Corinthians 8, 1, and now 13, 2, if I can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, but have not love, I'm nothing. Folks, it doesn't matter if you can quote the catechism. Are you doing what it says? It is right for us created by God to love him. Live for him. Okay? And integrate. So knowledge, heart, and then hands. Integrate those feelings, that love for God with how we're actually living. Now notice Paul doesn't say knowledge puffs up, therefore remain ignorant and do what you want. He doesn't say that. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, famous passage, he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So there's no point if your mind is renewed, if your life, your walk is not transformed. And another famous passage, Ephesians 2, you have the eight, verses 8 and 9, grace you by saved, not by works. No one can boast, but we often forget verse 10. We are created or almost recreated, born again. That's the sense of it. In Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to walk in, for us to do, to perform. The Christian life of discipleship, what does it mean to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus, is a constant reintegration, a constant reforming of our life so that we live more and more for the real Jesus who's really there, really in the Bible, because we really love him and we really want to live for others in his name. And we can know this Jesus and keep living for him, especially when we're ashamed of how far we fall short. If anyone of us is right now feeling down and miserable because you don't love God enough, because you're not living for him, hear this good news. In the beginning of verse 3, the Apostle Paul says he was explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Why is it that we can love the real Jesus according to the real scriptures? Why is it we can live for him? Because he sacrificed himself for us. Fearlessly love this Jesus. Do not come before him like some judge. Oh, you failed again. This is one of the things with being a professional background church of East Asian background. Look, it's not just an Asian thing. You know the joke? Oh, you're an, you're an Asian, not a Bijan. Okay, so always we have these high standards, which is not wrong in itself, but it means we can feel that we are constant failures before Almighty God. No, you're not because of the real Jesus, according to the real scripture. The Messiah, the Christ, suffered and died as a sacrifice to release you from that performance. And so according to the real Jesus, just reintegrate your life because it's fun. It's wholesome. It's good for you and everyone else. That's what it means to repent. Paul's preaching brought some to repentance. First point, second sub point. <laughs> okay, verse four, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a few prominent women. Now notice again, it doesn't say they were impressed with his personality or they wanted a better life or something. They were persuaded. It's rational. But you'll notice it. others started a riot. True Christianity integrates. Notice in verse 4, the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks. It's international. It's multicultural. We've seen this time and time again in the book of Acts. But the anti-Christians, they were the ones who fragmented, who broke everything apart. They started an angry riot. Verse 5, other Jews were jealous. They rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. Now, when it says jealous here, don't think that this means it's a good translation. Don't blame the translators. But this, in this context, it doesn't mean that they were, their power was threatened. What it means is they were jealous for what they thought was true Jewish religion. Zealous. Doctrinally pure. And they were therefore perfectly rationally from within their own like doctrinal system, within their own beliefs 
They thought Paul and Silas were dangerous heretics who were destroying Jewish culture, destroying Jewish religion, and sellouts to the Romans or demon-possessed or something. Okay? Because for them, and we've seen this over the book of Acts, the idea, verse 3, the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. That is a massive insult. A deep violence upon their religion. That's what they thought. They were jealous for the faith of their fathers. Does that make sense? Not just jealous for their own power. It's a much more noble jealousy. In that sense, a rational jealousy. But they started a riot. It wasn't it proves that what they believed is not good. Okay? Anti-Christianity, unhealthy belief, fragments and leads to anger and viciousness. It, they fractured the peace and harmony of the city in a way that the true preaching brought people together, Jews and Gentiles, Greeks together in peace and harmony. And that riot also involved lying. You can't do good. Never, you don't even need to be a Christian to believe this. You can't do good for society if it involves lying, okay? Look what they said in verses 6 and 7. When they did not find them, Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. Look, I'm sorry, that's a fake. That's fake news. That's not good news. That's a falsification a caricature, a parody of what Paul and Silence and even what Christianity is saying. Okay? Uh, Jesus did not come to be political. That's what they, uh, what, what they say. There is another king, one called Jesus. They're defying Caesar's decrees. There's, there's the thing with this kind of deception. There's an element of truth because Jesus is the king. That's what it means to be the Messiah. Okay, but as God incarnate, Jesus was given an opportunity when he was disputing with the Pharisees to prove that what these opponents are saying is true. And he didn't take it. Mark chapter 12, verse 17, just jot it down. I'll read that in a moment. Mark 12, 17, when Jesus was debating with the Pharisees, or rather the, his opponents were debating with him, they gave him a coin and Jesus said, well, give to Caesar's what is Caesar's and give to God what is God. Now think about that. Jesus Christ, God incarnate, king and ruler over the universe as both in his divinity as God, he's the ruler, king of kings and lord of lords and in his humanity as the Christ, the office of Messiah. Okay, he's king of kings and lord of lords. God in the flesh affirms that Caesar can have his money. So what's all this nonsense about defying Caesar's decrees? Most of the time, we who belong to Jesus don't have to defy the secular government. Okay? Because God rules in a good and healthy and multi-religious, plural, tolerant way through secular governments. As long as the government legislates what is good. I, I, had a, I saw a sad thing a couple of days ago. There was, uh, there was a detour and police, um, police cars and stuff. And I thought, oh my gosh, what's happened? So I just pulled over to the side because I wasn't sure the, de the detour was taking me off my route. I needed GPS. So I pulled over to the side and I just jumped out and I said to the policeman, what's happened, sir? There was all this f like forensic stuff. It looked like something out of those murder mystery novels that I like to read. I said to the police officer, what's happened? He said, someone got hit by a car. Folks, obey the street signs, obey the speed limits. Otherwise, you could kill someone. You don't need to be a Christian to believe that. That is God through the secular government showing us how to love people, isn't it? You don't need a Christian government to do that. You don't need to be Christian to do that. We who are Christian love secular government as long as it legislates what is genuinely good for everyone. But in these angry, fragmented, irrational times, get ready for irrational persecution. Look what happened to poor old Jason. Verse 8, when they heard this, 
So getting back to Acts 17, Acts 17, 8. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Uh, then they put Jason and the others on bail and let them go. Well, at least they didn't get beaten up. They didn't get executed. They didn't get thrown out of jail. But because the lies get traction, the irrationality sounds persuasive, expect to get lied about, and irrationally made trouble for, just because you're Christian. In today's unhappily irrational, angry era, and that's why what happened in Berea was really quite unusual. Praise God. Okay, so now we're on my next major point, And don't worry, everything's going to speed up from now on. In verses 10 to 12, gospel rationality actually enhanced Berean society. The Berean Jews, they didn't blindly accept what Paul said either. They reasoned it out, but they did it in a peaceful way. Notice verses 10 to 12. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, when they went to the Jewish synagogue. Oh boy, here we go again. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message with great, great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Again, they didn't just blindly accept it, okay? They examined the scriptures to see if what Paul said was true. And therefore, many of them believed, but many doesn't mean all. Not all the Jews were convinced, at least not initially. But here's the amazing thing. This, it looks like, what does it mean that they were of more noble character? It does not mean that they just blindly accepted what Paul said. Oh, good people are those who do what we say and who accept us. Bad people are everyone who disagrees with our tribe. I'm sorry, that's not what the passage says. Noble character means reasoning it out from scriptures, examining the scriptures to see if what we say is true, and accepting it if you think what we say is true, what the Bible says is true. And there's peace. This is what's amazing. There is a true peace, a principled pl peaceful pluralism between those who accept it and those who don't. And so we can be glad that in Berea, Jesus' words did not come true. Yeah, you heard me right. I'll say it again. We can be glad that in Berea, Jesus' words did not come true because Jesus warned us about this irrational persecution and hate mongering in Mark 13, 9 and 12. Mark 13, 9 and 12. Jesus said, you will be handed over to the local councils. You will be flogged in the synagogues. Brother will betray brother to death. The father is child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Where? It's not happening in Berea. What's the matter? And this peace between believing and not yet believing Jews seems to have the good result of encouraging peace between Jew and Gentile. Verse 12, back in Acts 17, verse 12, uh, be, the Jews believed, as did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men, same thing. The gospel integrates, hold together, different societies, different ethnicities, different cultures. This is what it means for the Ber Bereans to be of noble character. They examined it to see if it was true. They, it was rational. And if they were convinced, they took it on board. They weren't just some conformists. They believed it wholeheartedly. But also, praise God that those who didn't believe seemed to honor and respect those who did in a way that is unusual. This is the kind of principled, peaceful pluralism that we mean by religious freedom today. In a couple of weeks' time, second week in June, I think, uh, June 10 and 11, we'll put some in information on Facebook. We're having the, there's a, a religious freedom weekend being called by the Freedom for Faith um, institution. And it's a good, good thing to do. Let's see what we can work out here at Grace Point. Okay. It's what we want to, the whole world to enjoy is the kind of peaceful, principled pluralism that the Bereans enjoyed. You don't all have to become Christian. We want you to think about it, and we would like, we ask, okay, we challenge society, all societies around the world, to respect the fact that Christianity is good and that we have something real and rational to say to the world. If you don't believe it, fine. We'll live in peace with you because we're not about forcing anyone. Paul didn't force anyone. 
he urged, so please excuse us if we are passionate, because we really believe it's good. Just like someone who follows a certain footy team really passionately believes they're good and wants everyone to convert to that footy team. You're going to persecute them as well? Passion is not the problem. Take the time to work it out. And then enjoy that goodness for yourself because we want to integrate. We want to do what's good and wholesome for everyone, which we think Jesus is good for everyone. It's the opponents coming from outside who disrupt Berean society. Verses 13 and 15. The Christians don't make trouble. The anti-Christians do it. When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast. Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join as soon as possible. Folks, we're so human-centered. We tend to think that rationality, intellect is sinless. That's not the case. Sin is irrational. To reject the creator God is not smart. It's really foolish. In a couple of months' time, we're going to do a series on the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To know the one true God who created us is the way to reintegrate even your mind. Therefore, opposition to the one true God and to Jesus is not rational. It's angry, it's riotous, and that's what happens here. Agitating the crowd, stirring them up. There's a missionary couple, I know. I won't give you their name. They're in a secure location. Well, not anymore. They went to a foreign land, okay, and they spent years getting to know the locals, settling down, building trust, and helping and caring for the local community, doing medical work, education, this, that, and the others. More than a decade, they were Christians. They were explicit about the fact they were Christians, but they didn't make any trouble. I actually can't remember if anyone became Christians through them. Okay, But after more than a decade, a foreigner, actually a white person, a European background person, coming from overseas, came and visited, discovered these people are Christians, and this anti-Christian white person hit the roof, slandered the missionaries, frightened the locals, and basically manipulated things so that the missionaries' visa was not extended and they had to leave the country. Finish. Years and years of good work to care for that country and care for that people group, wasted. Not by a local. The locals loved the missionaries and honored them and honored their Christian identity, which they were upfront about, wrecked by a visiting anti-Christian. Let me summarize. In 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, the apostle Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Basically, that's what today's passage is saying. To give the reason for the hope that you have is not just to give your testimony. That's a good thing. But it means to do what Paul did, to reason out Christianity, to explain from the Bible what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah and as the Messiah to die and rise to forgive us and bring, it to, bring us to eternal life. But it can't just be intellectual. We have to show it in our life, that good behavior in Christ. Peter says it. Christian rationality, biblical rationality, true religious rationality integrates. It brings peace and wholesomeness in everything. Yes, it's intellectual. It's deeply intellectually satisfying, but not just intellectual. It makes us love God and love Jesus and want to live for him. And therefore, from that, we seek to live for Jesus in all of our life. True biblical Christian rationality is the adventure of reforming our lives, reintegrating our lives for the rest of our life, according to the real Jesus, as recorded in the real scriptures. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, that you give to us the challenge, the opportunity, the invitation to really live for you. We confess that we tend to live a disintegrated, unhealthy life. We tend to be foolish and do what we want, 
not what we know you want, not what we are confident according to scripture is the best way to live according to you. And that's really dumb. That's really foolish. Thank you that you are kind towards dumb, sinful people. And that's why you sent Jesus to die and rise, to forgive us and bring us back to you in his name. And out of love for him and for his honor, we pray you will work in us to continue to reform and reintegrate our lives day by day. Help us to help each other to do that. Help us to probe the depths, as it were, of our dark desires, our shames, our hurts, and bring that to the light of your gospel. And may we experience the wonderful joy of being completely and consistently forgiven and then renewing and reforming and reintegrating our life in your name. Amen.